Um, so in, in our unfolding drama of um, computational complexity, classical versus quantum, we are coming to the exponential separation. So first you saw David Deutsch, and David comes and says, look, quantum can do better. It's just a very simple example, but computing with quantum oracles gives you some sort of advantage. Then two computer scientists, Ethan Bernstein and Umesh Vazirani, come along and say, well, actually, we can do a little bit better. We can uh, show you a problem that, the way we have a linear separation. So instead of um, running something n times, calling your oracle n times, you can call it just once. But this, this, this one has to be quantum, and, and you can solve this problem in one shot. But you know, if you really want to impress computer scientists, especially theoretical computer scientists, you want to, you have to show them uh, some sort of exponential separation in computational power. Then they will go like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, and uh, the reason for that is, of course, because that affects the computational complexity classes. I, I have to be actually quite careful here because uh, we are still operating within this oracle model of computation. So those are black boxes. We don't look inside. What's going on inside is, is, is not uh, of any interest to us. We, we view any quantum function evaluation or, or classical evaluation of this oracle as just one computational step. So that's a bit of a cheating. And uh, if you want to do it properly, then um, you will have to just look inside the box. But that's, that's the next step. Um, so, so here comes uh, Dan Simon's problem. So then, uh, then Simon just look at the Boolean function that maps a set of binary strings of length n into a set of binary strings of length n. And uh, we are promised that this function is two to one. So there is a, some secret non-zero secret string um, that uh, is l acts like a period. So f of x is equal to f of x plus s. And this addition here is a binary bit by bit addition. So the underlying structure is this group z to uh, n, right? So um, our task, of course, is to find this period, to find this value of s, to find this binary string s with um, s few calls to the oracle as possible. So um, how shall we do that? Um, in, in the classical case, when you are given such a black box and you want to be absolutely sure so that, that you'll find this, so the worst, what is the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is that uh, you start, of course, looking for collisions. So you're looking for two binary strings that will give you the same value. So when you have those two binary strings, you know that uh, you can find S, right? Because uh, you can just take, you can just add them together. You can take exclusive, uh, or so if you just pick up uh, two binary strings that give you the same value, um, so, the, so that would be like X and X plus S. So then if you add them together, you'll have x plus x plus s. Of course, this is just a zero, right? So you'll get s. So you're looking for collisions here. And um, the worst case scenario is that uh, you'll just try one by one, and uh, you're not seeing any collisions. And uh, at some point, uh, you know, when you reach uh, half of uh, of those strings in this domain. Um, so if you add uh, 2 to the n minus 1 attempts or calls to the oracle, so then, then the next one will, will certainly succeed, right? So this is like the worst case when you want to get it for sure. But, but, but of course, you know, there are better ways of doing this. Uh, for example, you can consider picking up randomly um, a certain number of those strings, say m. And so what is, uh, what is the chance that um, you'll find a collision there? So how many collisions do you expect in a subset, in randomly selected subspec, su subset, <laughs> subset of uh, m binary strings? 
Um, or we can just have a rough estimate. It's not going to be precise. You can just go for more uh, precise estimates, of course. Uh, but just, uh, I just want to just convey the, con the, the main concept. So when you have um, a random subset of um, m elements, so you have m times m minus 1 over 2 pairs. So let's don't be too pedantic, say m squared of them. And uh, for each pair, what is the probability that you have a collision? So if I just pick up one binary string and then just randomly another binary string, so um, then the probability that I'm lucky is 1 over 2 to the n, right? Or 1 over 2 to the n minus 1, but roughly 1 over 2 to the n. So, so the number, expected number of uh, collisions in the set would be m squared uh, divided by 2 to the n. So that means that uh, just to have a reasonable chance that you find uh, a one, um, one collision there, your m has to be of, uh, m squared has to be of the order of 2 to the n, so m has to be something like 2 to the n over 2. You know, it doesn't really matter, never mind all these details, it's exponential, right? It's exponential in N, and uh, you can actually go for more sophisticated estimates, and you will show that this, this thing here is, is kind of optimal. So that's, that's the end of the story. The classical story ends here. What about the quantum side of the story? So the quantum side of the story is that um, using quantum oracles, um, you, all you need is roughly n calls to the oracle. So on one side we'll have linear, on the quantum side, on the classical we'll have exponential. So let, let us now show that it is indeed the case. Um, so first of all, this is actually the quantum circuit that does the job. Now look at this circuit and you should immediately recognize um, a very familiar pattern, right? So you can see that the top register is like our multi-qubit quantum interference, Hadamard quantum function evaluation. We know what it does. It introduces all kinds of phase factors. And you have to close the interference. So you have another Hadamard, and then you will measure something here, about which in a moment. Um, but this time, instead of um, preparing the second register in some sort of eigenstate, I I'm going to use a I'm going to show you another techniques how we analyze quantum algorithms. So I prepare the second register in state um, zero. So I prepare it in binary, s binary string zero, zero, zero. I set up each qubit in the second register to zero. So let's step through the execution of this circuit and see what we get. So let me just uh, separate the, the classical part from the quantum. I uh, hope I can squeeze myself here. Mm, so let's see. We start with... Um, state, uh, the first register in state 0, so it holds binary string 0, 0, 0, 0, and uh, the same for the second register. So then we go for the Hadamard transform, so that will give us sum over all binary strings x, x, 0. Now let me just drop the normalization uh, constant so you can you can um, you can fix it if you want to okay so the next thing is uh, quantum function evaluation so that the, so this is what is after the Hadamard we are here at this point when then we do quantum function evaluation so that will create a superposition X in the first register and the value of the function f of x in the second register. So we are here now. Right? We did the quantum function evaluation. So now I told you that I'm going to now measure the second register. I'm going to measure it bit by bit. So I'll get some value which corresponds to the value of the function on something, right? So that at this point when I perform this measurement, I, using this ugly language of quantum collapse, which doesn't exist, of course, right? But it's, it's a convenient mathematical shortcut. There's no physical process behind it. You, you perform the measurement, of course, it is a physical process, but um, it, is like, it is like an interaction, right? So 
never mind. <laughs> so um, at this point, you collapse the whole thing into um, two values in the first register. Call, let me just call it A plus, and the second one will be labeled A binary edition, A plus S. So and the second register is in state F of A. Now, um, so you can see that uh, when we register something in, in, when we perform the measurement here on the second register, we, we get a binary string. And that binary, binary string is the value of the function on, on something, on, on, on one of the binary strings, actually on two binary strings in, in the domain of the function. So those two binary strings are separated by this uh, period s. So I just call the first one a, and then we know that the second one has to be a plus s. So at this point, uh, the second register of, uh, is of no interest to us, so we'll do the Hadamard on the, on the first register. So we go for the Hadamard on the first register, and what we will get is sum over binary strings y, and I have here minus 1 a dot y plus minus 1 a plus s dot y and then I have cat y here so this is a, again I, I'm just dropping the normalization constants here, but uh, this is the expression that I have. And uh, we can write this further. I'm going to factor out minus 1 a dot y. So I'm going to have a sum, which goes like this, sum over y. And I'll have here minus 1 a dot y. And here I will have 1 plus minus 1 raised to the power s dot y and the cat y. Okay, well, um, let's look at this expression here. You can see that uh, if s dot y, so let's let's concentrate now on on this term here. You can see that s dot y can be either zero or one, right? So now, if it is equal to one then this term here is minus 1, so 1 plus minus 1 gives you 0. So that means that uh, the whole factor in front of uh, this cat disappears, it's equal to 0. So th that, that you will never see any outcome for which s dot y is equal to 1. So all you will see are the outcomes when s dot y is equal to 0. So that, uh, in this case, this term here is equal to plus 1, so you have 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, and you can see that you will actually have equally weighted superposition over all y such that s dot y is equal to 0. So when you measure something here, you'll get a binary string, call it, uh, after the first run, call it y1, such that y1 dot s is equal to zero. Well, that's not enough to figure out what the value of s is, right? But it, it gives you some sort of uh, information and uh, you can carry on. So run this circuit the second time. You'll get uh, another y, call it y2 for the second run, that has the same property. It's kind of orthogonal to s. And you carry on and, and you run it uh, say k times, so y k dot s is equal to zero. And then uh, you have a set of linear equations which you can solve as long as uh, y1, y2, yk are independent from each other. So as long as, you know, this k is uh, equal to n, the number of bits that uh, the length of those binary strings or, or more, and as long as uh, those uh, binary strings that you get as the result of running and measuring the 
the, the first register, as long as, as those uh, binary strings are um, linearly independent, which I mean, in order to get something new and useful from uh, running the over and over and over again, when you get, uh, say, y3 that is equal to y1 plus y2, you're not getting any new information. So, so you can estimate that the probability of uh, getting a, a set of linearly independent binary vectors is actually uh, you know, fixed. It's sort of like greater than, than a quarter or so. And you can do more subtle estimation of, of your success. But it, 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 it's, it's not a big deal. You know, you can, you can easily do the simple classical post-processing. You can run your circuit roughly n times, and you get the result. You can calculate the value of s. So, so here we have this beautiful result then. So on one side, we have a um, um, classical scenario in which you have uh, exponential. So let me just write here. So this is exponential. And then here we have the, the quantum case, and it's all linear. So it's a beautiful exponential separation. So that's, that's Simon's algorithm.